of gardens. I want to wander round the half wild, half tamed garden of my own mind in the next little talk. It's this half wild, half tamed aspect that I think gives gardens their special nature because they are constructed, human beings tend them and make them to a considerable extent, and yet it is nature. So it is the intersection of the artificial, the human, and the natural and the wild. Although the first great garden um, in the Western cosmology, so to speak, or the Christian one at least, is the Garden of Eden. And that was entirely natural because God created it and um, there was no gardening, as it were, done by Adam and Eve. And it was when they started to think too deeply and start pondering on uh, matters of, of good and evil and eating various apples and so on that they were expelled. So the myth of innocence and return to a garden which is behind much of Western thought and poetry and art, is something that attracts one also. The place of gardens in great literature, in great paintings, and, of course, in garden designs. I think I became uh, first interested in gardens really through the influence of my grandparents. I'd been brought up in Assam in India and there I'd had different kinds of gardens uh, influencing me, particularly tea gardens in Assam. So as a child of four or five before I came back, I'd lived on a tea garden and I, when I went back years later, suddenly it brought back the smell of a tea factory and walking through the lush tea estate. And of course, there was the bungalow garden. Uh, the the Bara bungalow, the big bungalow, had an extensive garden with four or five gardeners looking after it. And Assam is famous for its plants, its uh, butterflies, its trees. And so I roamed through these beautiful gardens in my childhood. When I came back to England at the age of five, we moved to Oxford and then to a house in Dorset, which had a large garden. We rented the house from a distant relative, and this was a garden of childhood, very strongly imprinted on my memory, because it was a beautiful mixture of various features which I've always loved about gardens. One was that parts of it were very wild, or quite wild. There was a little, uh, two little woods, one particularly, with fir trees and other trees. So it was a forest garden. And then there was another area near the bottom which was a vegetable, big vegetable garden and fruit trees. Particularly, I remember the smell of currants, red currants, white currants, black currants, which were caged against the birds. And so it was a growing garden. And then it was also a garden with a big lawn where we used to play football and cricket and so on. And there were lots of apple trees. And there was a, an area with secret passages. So throughout my life, that has been the model kind of garden I would like. And I've created it later in my life to a certain extent. Then we moved to the Lake District and uh, into Hawkshead, uh, or near Hawkshead, where William Wordsworth was educated. And we had a smaller garden. It was quite rocky and it had a few vegetables, um, a big uh, tree, um, some apple trees, and a garden shed. And I've always liked having a place in a garden where I could sit and look out or read and work. And so that was another garden. And in both those places, my grandfather, who had retired from the Indian uh, army was a very keen and good gardener. He loved gardens. He grew fruit 
Uh, I still have an apple tree that James grieved because his name was James, which he loved. He grew fruit. He uh, cultivated in Dorset tobacco. And I still remember the flying foxes hanging down in the garage drying. And he um, had an, an enormous interest. He used to get gardening newspapers, magazines, gardeners, diaries. And so he encouraged me and taught me and gave me seeds and set me on the path of gardening. My grandmother was more into chickens. Um, the garden there was filled with chicken houses. And so we produced in those austerity years after the war our own eggs and fruit and vegetables. And so gardens were in my spirit. Later in my life, um, I went, when we came to the Fenland village of Lode near Cambridge, um, we had, a, by chance, a very big garden. It had been a farm, and so there was about an acre of land, which at the beginning we turned into big allotments with lots of vegetables and uh, fruit trees and so on. And we planted dozens of fruit trees, which are still alive, most of them, and many small uh, trees, silver birch and um, others that have grown now into ma massive and magnificent trees. And then gradually over the years the gardens changed and became uh, wilder. We gave up the allotment later on and now it's a garden filled with paths and trees and roses and memories. It's what I call a memory garden because Many of the trees and plants and stones and other things have been given us by people, many of whom are now dead or gone. And when we pass them, we say, oh yes, that's Patience's apple tree, or that's my grandmother's tree which grew behind her house, or whatever. And so a walk round it is a walk through memory of my life and friends and family. And it is enormously refreshing. I find that the best work is done in my garden. I sit at my desk uh, reading, writing, thinking very hard, but the thoughts are and the problems are too close to me. So every hour or so I relax, let my mind relax, walk down through the garden paths, take different paths each time, notice different things, forget about the problems, and then later refocus. And so this is the kind of English wild, semi-wild garden that I like. And it's very different, as I discovered later, from gardens in most other parts of the world. The formal gardens of the continent, the gardens in Paris or in Rome or in Madrid or in uh, the chateaus of France, are much more classical and formal than these half-wild English gardens. Or again, the gardens in Japan, miniature, uh, miniaturized rock, sand, zen gardens have an entirely different feeling, as do the rock and water gardens of China. Each is special in its own way, but uh, for me the English garden represents the sort of slightly anarchic, slightly anomalous, slightly... Um, circuitous nature of English civilization, its legal system, its social system. And so for me it's very, very English and a delight and a way of creative thinking. Gardens are good to think with because they stimulate all your senses at the same time. So they're very powerful. The sight of the birds, the sound of the birds, the smell, as well as everything else hits you and goes deep into you and many of these things break back, evoke memories and stimulate you to further thoughts. So when you read what I've written elsewhere you will be travelling down the gardens of my mind which have been often created in the actual gardens uh, here and in my college in Cambridge where I also love the gardens of my college particularly the Chinese garden by the bridge, which I helped to 
start a few years ago. So enjoy your garden. Bye.